لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله الذي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعوانه وأنصاره I am grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this blessing of being here today with you and I pray that inshallah your entire program today would be inspired by Allah's light of guidance and inspirations inshallah. I wish I was able to be here for the entire program, but uh, as you may know, we have parallel interface program in the Islamic Center, so already we are in the church, and now I have to go for the second part of the Islamic Center. But for sure, my heart has been here throughout the day, and I want to particularly thank uh, brothers and sisters in MSM for organizing this and in a special way to thank uh, Sheikh Jahangir who has put energy and time and with his leadership MSM has been uh, moving very well and we pray that inshallah would be inshallah in future also going well we need such platforms in which our great and esteemed teachers of the community and admins of different madrasas come together share their thoughts their experiences if there is a need for workshops for training when we work together inshallah everything can be better arranged so this type of program is very important for our community. It has educational side and it has organizational side. And for me, these two are very, very important. I always say my mission is, inshallah, to help the community grow in the education and organization. And then when it goes to outside the community with public relations and reaching out to the rest of the society here. So this particular project is very, very important. And I hope every one of us would do his or her best, inshallah, to help this, inshallah, flourish. So again, I thank all the organizers. I thank all you great teachers of our community, great assets of our community. May Imam Zaman, inshallah, be pleased with you. And may, inshallah, Imam Zaman, help you in your this great mission of educating our children inshallah this particular program was dedicated to the quran and the community of ahlul bayt is a community which has highest regard for the quran compared to other muslim communities our regard for the quran must be the highest we should be known by everyone that for our community the Quran is the first and the most important source of inspiration something around which we want to build our life so Quran is the manual for our life and this event is very important so as I've been told uh, you have been given the link to the series of lectures we had last semester in the Hose on 
the Quranic studies and I just heard that Alhamdulillah 60 people also took part in the exam and so it's good I hope all the 60 listen to all the lectures I assume so I it was not just based on the <coughs> prior information uh, but if you have not studied to the lectures so inshallah please take time and listen to them uh, not because it is my lecture I was the least important person it was a fruit and product of the hose all the students and participants had shared in these lectures and we were discussing together and talking and you know trying to understand uh, how we can better appreciate the Quran this session is supposed to be uh, most interactive and uh, based on question and answer so maybe just I share a little bit uh, one of the points that we discuss in the course and then inshallah we will open it to your comments and questions and ideas uh, in this course that we had we try to address different aspects of the Quran but some of those things that we discussed might not have received enough attention in the books or lectures on the Quran so I want to highlight some of those aspects that are receiving unfortunately not enough attention one is about how to recite the Quran what should, should be our type of reading and recitation so this is something that we try to discuss in details not only the manners of having wuzu and facing qibla and this type of adab al-zahiri but also how to relate to the Quran how to make the Quran a special part of your life and how to feel that how much Allah has valued you by giving you his book in a personal way for example you know one example that we had in the class was if you have a letter which has been written by your late mother and whenever you miss your mother you go back to your you know drawer you take that letter out and read that letter how do you feel your feeling is different from a person who doesn't know your mother and doesn't have a special relation with mother and reads the text unfortunately the way we read the Quran is many times like reading any text but a moment when reads the Quran has that feeling that this is the letter that my beloved has written for me so just to have that letter in your hand is inspiring and is a way to connect so we try to develop this idea and inshallah you can find it in the lectures another thing that this was towards the end of the course but something from the beginning of the course was about the special position of the Quran with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we say Quran is the book of Allah we should know that Quran as a series of 114 chapters with some 60,000 verses this is one face of the Quran this is one side of the Quran which is magnificent still after 14 centuries of hard work of our scholars great people like Allama Tabatabai like Sheikh Tusi like Sheikh Tabarsi still we are new to this linguistic side of the Quran still much more to delve and discover but this is just the face of the Quran which has turned towards us this is still 
the Quran's image which is available to us. This is an image of a reality which has gone through many levels of simplification and put in the form of a text so that we can reflect and understand. But the reality of Quran is much higher. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Inna ja'alnaahu Qur'anan arabiyyan la'allakum ta'qiloon. We made that reality into a text either in Arabic or clear. Arabian here can mean Arabic language or can mean clear. A text which is Arabic or which is clear. Why? So that you understand. So the intention of making that reality available in the form of a text was to make it understandable. Even a non-Muslim can read the Quran and understand. But don't think Quran is just this. وَإِنَّهُ فِي أُمِّ الْكِتَابِ لَدَيْنَا لَعَلِيٌّ حَكِيمٌ But the same reality that you have only one image of it is with us. فِي أُمِّ الْكِتَابِ in the mother book, in the main book, in Loha Mahfuz, it's with us. Don't think Allah has sent Quran to us by sending the Quran away from Him. This is not the meaning of Enzal. Enzal is not like rain comes from the cloud to the earth. So when the rain comes here, it's no longer in the sky. This is not Enzal al Quran. The Quran has been sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us without departing the malakut. So it's just like someone has a very valuable manuscript and then sends you a photocopy of it so that you can get an idea of that. But that manuscript is with him. He doesn't let people to touch it. إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ فِي كِتَابٍ مَكْنُونٌ لَا يَمَسُّهُ إِلَّا الْمُتَحَّرُونَ Not everyone can touch it. So, إِنَّهُ فِي أُمِّ الْكِتَابِ لَدَيْنَا لَدَيْنَا is the highest position that anything can have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot find any position other than being لَدَيْنَا There is no possibility of ma'ana so the only thing that it can be there is ladaina or endana, maximum. So the Quran is in the highest position, and Quran is aliyun. Not only Allah is Ali, Quran is also Ali. Quran is high. Allah is Hakim. Quran is also Hakim. La aliyun, Hakim. So this is the reality of the Quran. This is how valuable is the Quran. How much Allah loves the Quran. We mentioned this hadith in the course that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says Hurmatul Quran ala Allah ka hurmatul walid ala al walad. Can you find any words to express the respect that Rasulullah that Allah has for Quran other than this? Hormatul walid ala al walad, not hormatul mathalan akh ala al akh. Hormatul walid ala al walad. Now imagine if, for example, I have a son that I love him very much and I respect him like my father. It's my son, but I respect him like my father. It means that it's exceptional son. This is Allah's book, Allah's word, Allah's knowledge and wisdom. And Allah respects the Quran in the way that if you want to use human relations and the way human beings respect each other, the best thing which can explain that relation is the way that a nice, a polite, a loving child would respect his father. 
This is the respect that Allah has for the Quran. What about the respect of Allah for those who respect the Quran? Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says that on the day of judgment when the Quran comes and it stands on the right side of the divine throne, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعِزَّتِي وَجَلَالِي وَارْتِفَاعِ مَكَانِي لَأَكْرِمَنَّ الْيَوْمَ مَنْ أَكْرَمَكَ وَلَأُهِينَنَّ مَنْ أَهَانَكَ By my glory, my dignity and my high position, whoever has honored you, I'm going to honor him. And if someone has not been showing respect to you, would be deprived of my respect today. So, these are some of the things that we discussed in this course. And I would love to know how did you find the course and how did you uh, relate to the ideas which were mentioned there. So, the floor is yours. how to recite the Qur'an, which sometimes can get quite boring for them. And there is also, at the same time, you have to balance enhancing that love in the heart. Can you give us some guidelines in terms of perhaps a structure of a lesson or, or what should be our priority? And bearing in mind there are different ages of those groups, different ages of the children. Thank you. This needs a uh, session, <laughs> but, but briefly, I think our aim should be to make them love Qur'an and appreciate the Qur'an. Actually, in the course we had, I told right at the beginning of the first session that I don't want to follow the a standard way of ulum al-Qur'an. My focus is to say those things that would add to our appreciation of the Qur'an and love for the Qur'an. Some of the technical things that they discuss in ulum al-Qur'an may not have that impact. So our main target is to make the love for Qur'an, appreciation for the Qur'an, a common understanding and feeling of our children. This is the main thing. Anything that we can do to make them love the Quran, respect the Quran, make the Quran part of their life is important. If we teach them how to recite the Quran, which is very important, if you have programs for reading, understanding, memorization, tafsir, all these things must be in this spirit of loving the Qur'an. Not that they can recite the Qur'an but their love has not increased even epsilon. Or they are in you know, half as of Qur'an but Qur'an is not part of their life. This is not enough. Like Salat, I always say we should make our students in the madrasa able to love Salat. Only, unfortunately, sometimes we teach them how to say Salat and we stand there next to them to make sure that they say Salat. But we see love sometimes is missing. And therefore, if the teachers go away for a few minutes, they sometimes make noise, you know, they hurt other people. Because the love and respect for Salat has not been passed on. The easiest thing is to make sure that they say Salat. Especially when they are young, they listen, they are obedient. But we have to make them really feel the greatness of the Quran, greatness of Salat, so much they can respect them. So I think if you are a person who, for example, teaches how to recite the Quran, 
every now and then you should take opportunity to say something about the Quran, directly or indirectly, some stories, some um, sayings of ulama, some, I don't know, for example, hadith about the significance of the Quran. A person who goes to, for example, a madrasa to learn Quran should know that this is different from going to a language center and learn, and for example, you know, a language. You, know, you may go to a language center and learn English, French, German. Even you may go to learn Arabic. But we are not here to learn Arabic. We are not learned to just read a text. We are here to see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken to us. So we have to help them develop a special relation, personal relation with this text. This is very important. Sorry, I couldn't do justice, but uh, just maybe for this time, it's what we can do. Um, I think what you have just spoken about with regards to Salah as well, I think that was a very good example with Quran and Salah. I think the biggest challenge we have here is the language barrier, because it's in Arabic. To, it's so important when we read Quran and when we do Salah that we understand that we, we love Allah. That's the idea. All the ulamas, all the teachers, all the scholars, they say the same thing. You need to put that love into the children to understand. So I have a question. Would it then be an idea, like you just gave a pure example of Salah and it just clicked into my head, that when the teachers move away, the kids start playing because they don't understand. So would it be an idea to perhaps maybe even start off the children reading the namaz or reading the Quran in English because English is their own language, that's what they understand. So if they can understand something that they're saying to Allah or Allah is saying to them in English, would it be an idea? Because all the time everyone has just emphasized Arabic. No, you have to read it in Arabic, you have to read the Quran in Tajweed, you have to know the alphabets. I personally, I'm from a Pakistani background, I can't read the Quran properly in Arabic with the tweet. But I still love reading the Quran. I, I enjoy it. I get peace out of it. Children younger than me, they won't feel the same passion. So would you recommend that that's a good idea? It's, it's just coming to my mind now, so I'd, I'd like your opinion on that. What would you say about using English as a source? We can certainly use English uh, to help them understand. Mm -hmm. But we should not be satisfied with that. Just to start. Just yeah, to a start or parallel, you know, because then which age you want to start, these are all things that we can discuss. But definitely, when you teach them, for example, you know, Surah Hamd in Arabic, you should also explain for them in English what is written here. Okay? So it's very important that they can understand, they can appreciate. This is what I'm saying. But we should know that these Arabic terms, not because they are Arabic, there are many other Arabic texts, but these Arabic terms are those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has picked up. And the order and sequence is also what He has designed. Okay? So we should feel very special about this. No translation of the Quran is Quran. No even um, Arabic explanation of the Quran is Quran. Even the hadith of the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt with all the respect that we have for them is not comparable to the Quran. Because this is something is handmade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know? Everything, the ingredients, design, everything is by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should make them understand this, inshallah. Yes, brother. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Um, right, to summarize, how should we introduce the Quran to children? Like, just like what topics, how should we do them then? You know, what we can do is for introducing to them this Quranic ideas, we can choose subjects which are relevant to their age. Okay, 
So we don't need to start with the deep theological questions in the Quran or deep philosophical, mystical questions in the Quran. Something that would relate, for example, maybe a good starting point are stories. Because stories, especially the Quranic stories, have this capacity that you can encounter them in different levels. You know? You can encounter the story of Isa alayhi salam in the basic level, you can encounter it in an intermediate level, and you can be a great alim and encounter it in a higher level. But the same story. So if we have good text and good preparation, we can mention this story even to a child in year one, but even we can produce a good explanation for a person who is a teenager or adult. So I think stories are good points. Moral teachings of the Quran are very good, especially those which relate to a child. For example, how to treat your parents, how to treat your brothers and sisters, how to treat neighbors, how to react to the people who may not be respectful to you. For example, if our child are bullied, children are bullied, for example, the school. So there are everything about this in the Quran. So if we start with these practical teachings of the Quran and the stories, I think this would be a good entrance to the ocean of the ideas which are in the Quran. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Salam I was listening to your lectures and uh, over here is question number eight, um, which talks about when the Quran um, refreshed. And I think you did mention about Quran being fresh. So I was a bit confused if you can explain a little bit about it. Yeah, this is one of the ideas that we actually uh, try to expand. Maybe we have spent two, three sessions on this. In my understanding, Quran is an ongoing revelation. The chapters are not increased, the verses of the Qur'an are not, even one word is not added to the Qur'an. But the light, the mercy, the healing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending to us through the Qur'an are ongoing. It's not that Allah sent something 14 centuries ago and we read about it. You know, if you look at miracles of, for example, Prophet Musa and Isa, that miracle was not ongoing miracle. We hear about it, we believe in it. It's very important that Musa السلام, had that stick or you know crossed the Nile or sea. Isa السلام, was giving life to the statues of the birds or you know reviving the dead. These are very, very important. But I only hear about it. Okay, I read about it, but I cannot see it. Okay, but Quran is different. Quran is not a miracle which was given by Allah to the Prophet and we hear about it. The Quran is a miracle which is ongoing. Some people think this, like me, most of people think that this means that because Alhamdulillah the text is available, so this is the way that we can benefit today. The text is available, but they say no, it's more than this. Quran is not a text which was given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the people of that age 14 centuries ago, and we just read about it. We and Muslims of that time or people of that time have the same share in the Quran. Allah has meant us as much as he has meant them. 
Even according to some hadith, there are certain things that Allah has said only for people of Akhir Zaman. So we are actually more meant than what they were meant. So my idea is that this is a like a device. Okay? This device has been given 14 centuries ago, but you can use this device to get live messages. You know, there is a difference between a tape recorder which was created 14 centuries ago and still we send the same message which was recorded 14 centuries ago or a radio device that always can give you live messages. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ الشِّفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ This نُنَزِّلُ is continuity. It's istimrar. And this is for us today. Still Allah is sending healing through the Quran. He's sending rahmah, sending light. This light is there. If we cannot see it, this is our problem. There are people who have seen the light coming after 14 centuries from the Quran. This is not a report about a light. This is light. If there is a river, if there is a spring, if Zamzam, which started in the time of Ismail, but still we can drink that Zamzam. You think Quran is less? We don't hear about Quran. We have the Quran. And then we mentioned many hadiths, which explains that Quran is always fresh. And in particular, we reflected on this important hadith from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. I just want to open your appetite so that you go back to the lectures. So one person asked Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, O oh, Imam, was Laylatul Qadr only in that particular month of Ramadan in which the Quran was revealed? Or it repeats every year? Okay, this is a question. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam said that Laylatul Qadr repeats every year. But then he mentioned something which is very important. Are you alert? Everyone is alert? Yes. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam said, had it not been that Laylatul Qadr repeats every year, La al Quran. Allah would have taken back the Quran. What does it mean? Think about it. Yes. I'm so sorry, I know we've got more questions, but we know we have to end it to here. So many thanks to, to Sheikh Dr. Muhammad Ali Shmali. Very fruitful session, you know, full of so many knowledge and information. You can give me minutes yeah. for my yeah. 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 No, you so can give me Yes. <laughs> 10 to 15 minutes, it's okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Um, we are teaching, reciting, writing sometimes, and apart from what you say, is, um, Arabic is kind of different. So they call it a Rasm al Qurani, which is a drawing of Quran. Sometimes you find, for example, Al Hayat, written in Quran, Al Hayat. Like there's wow rather than ah. So uh, actually we are confused. If you are teaching them in Arabic, so it should be al halat If you are teaching drawn Quran, the haywa. And when they go outside and find it different, this will make them confused. So shall we mix it or we stick to the Quranic drawing or Arabic? Yes. Quran is an oral message. Okay? So the words are picked up by Allah, the structure is by Allah, but the writing, handwriting, Rasmul Khat, is not divine. So Muslims gradually developed this Rasmul Khat. And there are mistakes in that Rasmul Khat. Mm -hmm. So for example, sometimes it has to be without Alif, like, Yad'u is for the first 
person, but there is alif, which is for the plural. But in order to make sure that no alterations take place, they try to keep with the same handwriting style which was there. Okay? But this is not anything that has to be like that. So now some ulama, even some of our marajah, have suggested, for example, that we can have a different rasmul khat. My suggestion is, before it is approved by our great ulama and marajah and comes to us, we shouldn't take the liberty of suggesting different rasmul khat. Let's keep with what we have. But inshallah, when we receive something from uh, specialized people and centers, then inshallah we can adopt that. They asked whether the, how much emphasis should we put in actual teaching of Arabic? Because there's Quran and then there's Arabic, and a lot of the madrasas, probably Pakistani maybe, we don't teach the Arabic, we teach Quran. Because, you know, traditionally there's a lot of emphasis on finishing the Quran, because that's the parents' expectations. There's a lot of emphasis on memorization of ayah, and that's what's done in the madrasas. So, could you just tell us what you feel would be the priority here? Reading the Quran in Arabic, I think, is something that every Muslim should be able to do, to read the Quran in Arabic. But learning Arabic as a language, with its grammar, saf and nah, it's very good if we can have it, but I don't think we should make it compulsory for everyone. We should encourage people to do it. We should have classes, optional classes, for the people who want to learn Arabic as a language. But I think the priority is reading the Quran in Arabic and keeping the mother tongue. For example, I think for, our, for example, our Pakistani brothers and sisters, in my humble understanding, for the children to be able to speak Urdu is more important than learning Arabic as a language. You know, as a language, not as reading the Quran. For Iranian people, their children should be speaking Farsi. Otherwise, our cultural, you know, connection will be lost. Imagine you have, for example, an Iranian, for example, child who cannot speak Farsi, so he cannot relate to his nation, his culture, his parents, for parents. But for example, he can read Arabic. He cannot be relating to Arabic community because his Arabic is not the way that he can, you know, speak with the Arabic people. And he cannot relate to his own people. My idea is, for years, that learning mother tongue for our community here is very, very important. Every person here should be able to speak his mother tongue. If we lose this, then you will lose your children. Your children should not even be able to speak Urdu, for example, or Farsi. They should feel the same passion that you have for this. Because if they speak Urdu or Farsi as a foreign language, it means that their mind is foreign to your mind. Some people are just happy that, Alhamdulillah, when I speak in Urdu with my children, they understand. It's not enough. Because be depending on which language is your first language, your mindset is formed. So we need to make sure that our children's mindset is the same mindset as the family, as home. So, I very much like people learn Arabic. I like people, you know, learn as many languages as possible, but especially Islamic languages like, you know, Arabic, like Farsi. These are important languages to learn, but I don't say we should make it compulsory. We should make it available. We should encourage people, we should give them prizes, but don't make it compulsory. What is compulsory is how to read the Quran in Arabic. This is compulsory. And mother tongue. 
That's compulsory. Memorization. Yes. Okay, let's conduct the memorization. Memorization. Memorization of certain chapters, I think, is necessary. But we don't need to make all people half us. If they love, it's good. If you can encourage them and make them, you know, interested. But by forcing, I think uh, it's not, you know, going to have good impact. For us, uh, understanding the Quran, implementing the Quran in our life are very, very important. Hefs is a good key. It's a good, you know, asset. But people are different in their memory. People are, you know, different in their, you know, uh, concentration. So you can see one of the things that you can do actually in madrasa is after one year, two years, to find out what a special talent some people have. Maybe some people have good talents for learning another language. Okay, teach them Arabic. Some people have good memories. So maybe out of 100 people, you can have 10 halfes of Quran, not all 100 people. So you have to identify people's talents and uh, you know, potentials and then help them. And then maybe, for example, in every madrasa, we cannot have a special program for hefs because the number is low, but every few madrasa can have one joint program for hefs. So this is possible.